Hi everyone, how are we going? Terry Brown, Mechanical Engineering here to go through another engineering mechanics um, problem. This time it's a machines problem, part of the frames and machines topic. So let's have a look at the problem. Right, yeah, here it is. So this time we have uh, an engine hoist or workshop mobile crane. Now this is becoming more like a, a, a practical problem. Still pretty simplified though, in order to keep it to a 2D planar problem. And at the end of the video, I'll, I'll look at some pictures of some real workshop hoists, just to compare the differences. There's some practical implications, you know, about how this is drawn here and how it gets practically applied. But um, we'll just analyze it as it is in, in the textbook problem, uh, and then think about other things at the end. All right, so we have uh, this hoist that supports the 125 kilogram engine, and we're asked to determine the force that the load creates in the member DB, which is this little supporting link down here, and also the member FB, which is the hydraulic cylinder. So we need to have a hydraulic pressure in the cylinder to generate this force up here to hold the boom in position and to support the weight of the engine. With these problems, we're applying the engineering mechanics method to solve it. First step is to draw a free body diagram and then apply the equations of equilibrium. Uh, but in a problem like this, we need to think about, well, what are we going to draw a free body diagram of? We could draw a free body diagram of the whole hoist and work out the forces at the wheels here. But that's probably not going to help us very much in determining the forces in, in the members. Not wrong to, to draw the free body diagram of the whole thing, but um, you know there, there's a, probably a better place to start, and that place would be to draw a, a free body diagram of the beam GFE currently in a horizontal position because that's got our known input into the problem. Okay, everywhere else we don't know what the forces are. The only place we know the force is through the weight of the engine. All right, so let's do that. We're not given any information about the weights of or the masses of any of the components. We're going to have to assume that the weights of the components are negligible. And as we often need to do with doing these frames and machines analysis problems, we need to look for two force members. Um, and there are only two force members if the weights of the members are, are negligible. So we'll make that assumption. And as I said in the introduction, we'll draw a free body diagram of GFE to start with. So let's do that. Label all our important points. Make your, your diagram large, neat and clear. Make sure your witness lines for your dimensions go to the points that they're referencing. Start by putting on our load. So the, the, the load into this problem is the weight of the engine. So the engine here is supported by the chain, um, but we know that the force in this chain, of course, must be equal to the weight of the engine, and that will be acting on the end of the beam here. All right, so that's there. Let's start to look at some other things at our end here, E, where we're connected to the, the post or the upright of the hoist. We've got a pin connection. So there, where we've removed that connecting member, we replace it with the forces that are being generated. And because it's a pin connection, we'll have two reaction forces. And I've already started to put in the direction. So let's go back a step and think about how I ended up with this arrow acting or pointing downwards. If we imagine that we take moments about point F, the weight is tending to rotate this boom around anti-clockwise around F. So therefore we need the force over the other side here to be pushing downwards to generate a clockwise moment so that this boom can be in equilibrium. And at this stage, we can't determine whether the horizontal force at E is to the right or to the left. So let's have a look at the force that's generated between the connection. Uh, I have done that, all right. Um, Maybe I've just guessed, or let's go and have a look at the force that's generated at F and see if that's right. 
uh, just remembering to label all of our unknowns. So we note that the component FB is a two force member in equilibrium. So we only have connections at two points and assuming that the weights are negligible, no other forces acting on this component, the hydraulic cylinder. So therefore it's a two force member. So therefore we know that the line of action of the force acting at each end of this component must be along the line joining the points F and B. Okay, so there's the direction of the force acting at F. Is it acting up to the left or down to the right? If we take moments or imagine that we take moments about point E, the weight of the engine out here is tending to rotate the boom anti-clockwise. So therefore we need this force here from our cylinder FB to be acting upwards and to the left to counteract that moment that's generated by the weight out of NG. Right, so we can put that arrow head on and now that we can now that we've got that we can go back over here and look at the arrow head on REX and see that what we put before or what I put before is now correct. Right. If this force is going to the left, then this force has to be going to the right for equilibrium. Label our unknown here, RFB. And we're going to need the components of this force in the horizontal and vertical direction. So I've just indicated the angle here, so do some trigonometry. And from our geometry that we're given over here on the, the hoist, that's our triangle. So this bottom side here is one. Okay, so two minus one gives us one here and the height is three. So if we want this angle in here, tan theta is opposite over adjacent. So the inverse of tan opposite over adjacent will give us this angle, right? And this is the opposite, this is the adjacent. Okay, so do the maths in your calculator and you get 18.43 degrees. Now we can start to apply our equations of equilibrium. So take moments about point E because we've got two unknowns going through there. So we have the weight times perpendicular distance, which is three. And it's tending to rotate anti-clockwise about point E. So therefore it's positive. And then we have the vertical component of the force in the member FB. So this is adjacent to the angle theta. So therefore that will be RFB cos theta and its perpendicular distance here will be two. And it's negative because it's tending to rotate in a clockwise direction about point E. Set that all equal to zero and solve for our unknown force RFB. And we get nearly two kilonewtons for the force in the hydraulic cylinder H. All right, so now let's just quickly do the force equilibrium equation. Some of the forces in the horizontal direction equal zero. We can see here REX will be equal to the horizontal component of RFB. So we need sine of the angle here. It's easy enough to work out REX there. And we've already calculated RFB down here. All right, so we just need to substitute that in. And then some of the forces in the vertical direction equal zero. We have the weight acting downwards, the vertical component of our force in FB, and the reaction force in the vertical direction at E. So R E Y in the negative direction, all equal to zero. Substitute for RFB and the weight of the engine, which is 125 times 9.81. All right, so moving on to the next part of the problem. So I've just copied over the free body diagram onto my next page just so I can reference it easily without jumping backwards and forwards to, from page to page. All right, so we've now found all of the forces acting on the, the boom of the hoist, so remember GFE, and we're 
In terms of what the problem asks for, we're also looking for the force in this link BD. But if we were if we were really analysing and designing this hoist, then uh, you know we've got to find the forces acting everywhere anyway. So uh, if we draw a free body diagram of EDC, uh, we don't draw a free body diagram of just BD on its own. Uh, that's not going to help us at this stage. But we do know that the force generated in BD is going to be acting on this member EDC that we have here. All right, so draw our free body diagram. Again, remembering to make it large, neat and clear. Put your dimensions on. Make the dimensions meaningful. Have the witness lines actually go to where they're meant to go. So at E here, where the two components were originally connected together, we now need to make sure that when we draw the forces at point E on our second free body diagram, that we obey Newton's third law. All right, so we can't just put anything here, we can't just guess. We have to go back and look at the free body diagram where we first drew or first showed the forces that are acting there. Okay, and what we put up here must be equal and opposite to what we have down here. All right, so label them the same, and then you can see the arrows are pointing in opposite directions to what I've got down here. All right, so must be equal and opposite because Newton rules, okay? So must obey Newton's third law. These are action-reaction pairs. The other thing that I don't want to see on your free body diagrams is things like this. When the members are still connected, we don't show the, the internal forces that are acting there. Because in reality, what we have there is that. Okay? If you really want to show forces, that's and be correct in what you're showing, that's what you would have to show. Okay, and there's really no point doing that. So just don't do it. We only show the forces acting on the members when they're separated. Then we make sure that we obey Newton's laws. Now, the other thing to note is if, for example, you had a in our first free body diagram, had the arrowhead going the other way here. The arrowhead to the, instead of having the arrowhead to the right here, on your free body diagram, if you had the arrowhead to the left and you'd done your equations and algebra correctly, you would have got a negative answer for REX. All right. Now, what you should never do is go and change the arrowhead on your free body diagram. Because then what happens is your equations of equilibrium don't match what's shown on your free body diagram. So better to just leave the arrowhead as it is. And then when you get and if you get a negative number here, when you do your equation of equilibrium over here, you just substitute in the negative value. Right? So you write your equation of equilibrium with the arrowheads as they are and then just substitute in the negative value. Moving on, member BD is a two-force member in equilibrium. So that's going to tell us the direction of the force at D. So we know it's going to be acting along the line joining B to D. And we can see that that's a 45 degree angle here because we've got one meter here and one meter here. On my force that I've drawn here for RD, I've already put the arrowhead. How did I get that? Let's imagine that we take moments about point C. The force REX up here is tending to rotate anti-clockwise. So therefore the force at D must be tending to cause this member to rotate clockwise. So therefore it has to be pushing up to the right. And then at the connection here at C with the bottom of the hoist, it's a pin connection, so we're going to have two components, horizontal and vertical, RCX and RCY. What will the sense of these forces be? 
So we can easily see that RCY will be acting downwards because RD is acting up and REY is acting up. And then can't quite tell just from some of the forces in the horizontal direction whether RCX will be to the right or to the left. So therefore, let's think about moments. If we take moments about point D, REX is tending to rotate this member anti-clockwise about point D, so therefore we need RCX to cause a clockwise rotation. So therefore RCX must be pointing to the left. Right, so there's my complete free body diagram. Start doing my equations of equilibrium. Take moments about point C down here. So REX and REY we already calculated previously from our previous free body diagram. So taking moments about point C will give us RD straight away, which was the thing that we're after in the question. But of course, we'll need to get forces at, uh, at C eventually if we're actually designing and analysing the whole hoist. But for this particular problem, we just want to know the force in the link BD. So we have REX, so the force up here, perpendicular distance to C is three metres, tending to rotate anti-clockwise, so that's positive. And then we have the horizontal component of RD. So RD sine 45, tending to rotate around clockwise. So that's negative. Perpendicular distance is 1. All equal to 0. So now we can solve for RD if we substitute REX from our previous free body diagram and we get RD is 2,600 newtons. Summarizing our final answers, force in FB in this hydraulic cylinder H is nearly two kilonewtons. Right, so if we're doing this as a design problem and we have to go and buy the hydraulic cylinder to put in here, this gives us information about what size hydraulic cylinder we need and the force in member BD here, right, that will tell us the size of this link that we need, um, the size of the pins that we need, and so on. Right, of course, to design the whole thing, we're going to have to analyze everything else. This is a beam in bending, so we're going to have to look at our bending stresses. Uh, similarly, for the vertical post here, this is going to be a beam or column in bending, so we'll need to look at calculating the, the stress from bending. All right, so just um, taking our simplified textbook problem and looking at some real hoists. So you can see here, a couple of things to note. Uh, in, in the three pictures that I've got here, the, the hydraulic cylinder you know, doesn't go like this. Um, you know, for practical application to to try and find a hydraulic cylinder of this length to, to do this is, is probably quite difficult and, and expensive. So here they've made a different, slightly different arrangement so that you can have a shorter hydraulic cylinder and a, and a shorter stroke on, on that cylinder. Slightly different arrangement also with the, this supporting strut. So the equivalent to this strut BD on these real ones, so here it's on the back, so that's supporting this post here that's at a bit of an angle. This one's vertical on this one and it's angled in front. So this one's a little bit more like the, the textbook example that we looked at, but instead of the hydraulic cylinder going down to the base here, it's going across to the, the vertical post, right? And the base of that hydraulic cylinder is here instead of down here. Um, so the other thing to, to consider is, you know, if this cylinder is coming down here on this one, you know, where, where is it attached to, right? Uh, so all of these, you can see we've got two legs on the base, whereas here on our textbook problem, we can only see one leg on the base, whereas here on all of our real 
hoist, there, there are two legs. Uh, so uh, if we're going to do this and attach the bottom of the cylinder somewhere along the, the leg here, then obviously we're going to need some sort of a crossbar here to do that. All right, but hopefully by being able to do this simplified problem, you can see how to take the how to take the analysis that we've done here and apply it to this. Right, if we draw a free body diagram of the, the boom in each case, then you know it's almost identical to what we've just done. Just the, the, the dimensions of the boom and its angle are going to be different. The other thing that you'll note is the shape of the boom. So this one here gets thicker or deeper around where the hydraulic cylinder is attached. And that's to take care of the bending stresses that are, that are developed. The other way to do that, as you can see in these other two here, you've got these um, struts, I guess, if you like, coming up here that uh, do a similar thing. Right, so as part of your design, the designer has to, to, to work out well, what's the, the most cost effective approach. Right, so really, you know, whether you do like we've got on the two on, on the left here, or whether we do like we've got on the right, really comes down to cost. So here we've got extra material, but here we've got extra work in welding these extra features that we've got on top here. Right, so you, you, you've got to do the, the financial calculations to, to, to help decide this. All right, so that's uh, it for the problem. I hope you found that interesting to, to look at some real voice after having looked at the simplified textbook problem and, and try and get into the habit of, you know, in your everyday life, to look back on the, the, the textbook problems that you've done and try and identify the, you know, the simplified textbook problems in real structures that you see around you. Uh, and that will help you to be able to analyze and design uh, things that, aren't, that don't look like the textbook. Uh, also try, you know, when you see a, a mechanism or um, a machine like this, try and imagine the free body diagram uh, and, and the forces that are acting and how you might go about solving for those forces. All right, that's it for now. See you next time.